This is the third and last uh, part, lecture part on uh, linear viscoelasticity elasticity uh, with uh, relation to asphalt concrete behavior. And uh, I would like to remind you of the expression that was derived. Uh, I will write the discrete version. This is the discrete version. It says that the strain at any time t of interest is a summation of all the stress steps that occurred before uh, the current time. And each one of them is uh, scaled or uh, multiplied by the grip compliance, taking into account the time elapsed between the current time when we're interested in a strain value to the time when the uh, stress step was applied. This is a discrete version. And uh, the automatic question is, what do we do if we have a stress history that is uh, not discrete, but it is continuous? Well, the answer is that we can approximate this uh, continuous stress history with steps, and we can get as close as we, are, we want to the real application of stress. So what we need to do is we need to split this into little stress steps. And since we have the ability to analyze the strain due to any number of stress steps, this strain his stress history that doesn't look, look, look like a stress steps can be approximated as best as we want. And that means that with this formula, you have the ability to solve for the strain in a viscoelastic material, given that the quick compliance is known, for any stress history of interest. I have here um, a plot of the grip compliance of asphalt concrete. This grip compliance was measured in a laboratory experiment. What I would like to point out is that uh, the time is appearing in a logarithmic scale, and that is needed because there is information in this function uh, starting from one millionth of a second, and even even in shorter time periods. And uh, he here we have a uh, one million seconds, which is uh, I don't know twelve days, eleven days, and then you have uh, even more information. If we were to look at this uh, curve, I would plot this here. So the grip compliance is kind of leveling off, reaching the instantaneous compliance, which we defined previously as d0, and it would be leveling off in infinity, and the value would be d infinity. And I would like that this uh, curve, unlike elastic materials, we are not allowed to calculate instead of the compliance as a function of time to calculate the reciprocal of the compliance which we call uh, relaxation 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 uh, modulus the relaxation modulus is not reciprocal of the quick compliance for elastic materials we know that d and e are reciprocal this is not the case for viscoelasticity however the infinity values d infinity and d0 are reciprocal so if we were to plot the relaxation function, the value here would be reciprocal to d infinity and the value here would be reciprocal to um, d0 or the instantaneous compliance. If I were to provide you the values here of this uh, um, grip compliance, they would be values are specific to this material that was tested. We have E0, which is uh, the reciprocal of the uh, instantaneous free compliance, to be equal to 30,000 megapascals. E infinity, reciprocal to the long time free compliance of 100 megapascals. Tau D is 100,000, and that uh, everything here was measured at 30 degrees Celsius, so this is relevant to 30 degrees Celsius. And the power N sub D was 0.4. I have some uh, points to make about these values. So think about uh, these these two. Let's let's look at the first one. Thirty thousand megapascals. This should remind you of the elastic modulus or Young's modulus of uh, Portland cement concrete. And uh, this is really uh, realistic. If we were to um, think of asphalt concrete at the moment that the load is applied on top of it, that instant of time where the load is applied, that is basically what short time creep compliance function is is referring to. The material's behavior at very short loading time. Times. So extremely short loading times, that is the instant that something touches the material, the response appears to be very stiff. It appears to have, the material appears to have a modulus of 30,000 megapascals, and that means that for the first uh, millionth of a second, it seems that we are dealing with a Portland cement concrete. 
And the other extreme case, and this is only for intuition purposes because we are not dealing with an elastic material, but uh, if you want to think of a viscoelastic material as a material that changes its modulus over, over time, then the instantaneous modulus is similar to that of Portland cement concrete. And then the modulus kind of degrades over time and ends up to be a very low value. You can see that there's a two, more than two orders of magnitude difference between the instantaneous modulus and the long-term modulus. 100 is something that represents a granular material, uh, the modulus of a granular layer or material. So in a way, when Asphalt concrete is loaded quickly, it uh, appears to have a high modulus, and when it is uh, loaded very slowly, it appears or behaves as if it has a low modulus. And in reality, if I need an uh, analog for you, then uh, imagine that part in the movies where you see an airplane landing and, and hitting the runway. That uh, hit that the uh, aircraft builds to the runway is a very quick load. At that point, the modulus that uh, run the runway can uh, provide is, is very high. And in fact, in design of airports, that part of the runway where there's a, a quick loading due to landing is, is not uh, critical in terms of payment design. What is more critical is where the airplanes are uh, moving slowly uh, towards takeoff. And, and in these cases, the movement is very slow. And, and we are on, on this side of the compliance or on this side of the modulus, which means that the, the asphalt behaves uh, as if it is a low modulus material. Um, another analogy could be between highways where you have uh, fast moving loads. And if you were to look at an element in the asphalt, that element experiences a very quick loading pulse when a, uh, a car travels by or a truck. And that means that the, the behavior is uh, governed by the initial part of the, the relaxation function or equivalently the uh, creep compliance. And if the loads were uh, very slow, let's say there's a traffic jam or an uphill where the trucks are very slow, then the response is governed by uh, the, the relaxation function or the creep compliance at the later time. And that means that we have, you can see lower modulus so higher creep uh, compliance. Last thing I would like to point out before we move to uh, a small assignment and some and a tutorial is about this curve. So it includes data from one millionth of a second to one million seconds. That means that if I were to take my piece of asphalt and send it to a laboratory and say, can you please provide me with a creep compliance uh, function? They would uh, say, we need some days, we need uh, a, long, a long time to provide you with the answer because the curve is still changing in our lab and that is not acceptable. We would like answers uh, quicker than, than uh, two weeks. The other point here is that the uh, very short time information is, is very expensive to obtain because you need special electronics to be able to capture data at this, uh, at this uh, short time or quick rates. So uh, unfortunately, there is a solution. I will explain in general terms the solution. Uh, it is uh, dealt with with more depth in the advanced course, the advanced payment course. So this chart that I just drew shows you uh, the grip compliance for an asphalt concrete. And the grip compliance is shown here for three different temperature levels. So let's say the first grip compliance, we took our time and we managed to measure it for uh, short periods and long periods, and we have all the electronics needed, and we ended up with a curve. And this curve was measured at a certain temperature level, and that temperature level is T sub zero, which is our choice, let's say 25 degrees Celsius. If we were to repeat the experiment, with the same exact material, but we would choose a lower temperature for the experiment. Let's say we would choose zero degrees Celsius. Then we would end up with a curve that is plotted here. This is temperature at the experiment smaller than the reference temperature that we chose before. And if you were to repeat yet again the experiment, this time with a higher temperature level, T greater than the reference temperature, then we would end up with another curve. So these different curves indicate that the material is thermally sensitive. But uh, what I would like to point out is that Close observation of these curves in the log log scale show that they're actually identical in shape. They are just shifted sideways, which means that this curve looks exactly like this curve. If I were to shift it, they would overlap. And the same here. That means that T infinity and D0, or E infinity and E0, they are not different when the temperature is changing. What is changing here is the, the tau D in the four parameter equation that I have. And N, the power, is the same. So n does not change, and d is, is influenced. n does not change, and d is influenced, and tau d is influenced by, by the temperature level. Now, how does this 
help us with uh, getting results faster from a laboratory. So the idea is as follows. Window. Let's say we uh, look at uh, short times, but not extra short, 0.01 seconds. And we look at long times, but not extra long, let's say 1,000 seconds. And within this uh, range of times, we repeat the creep compliance measurement. At the, instead of, uh, we repeat it at three different temperature levels. So we get this information when the temperature was cold. We get the, this information when the temperature was uh, room temperature. And we get this information when the temperature was hot. So the way to perform these different temperatures or to achieve them is to test in, a, in an environmental chamber or temperature control chamber. And it's like a, an oven or a refrigerator with a switch on. Uh, the temperature we would like, and we test the grip compliance. And it takes 1,000 seconds, and then we change the temperature, and then we test again, and then we test the third time. And since we know that these all are really pieces of the same, and now I will use the term master curve to represent the entire response, the entire grip compliance from very short times to very long times. Instead of measuring everything, we just measure the, the pieces. And we can add more pieces if you wanted, higher temperature, more uh, low, lower temperatures. And then in order to generate the original curve that we were interested in, that we were not interested to wait for, we just shift the curves sideways until they overlap and make the full curve that was uh, of our interest. And this idea is called time temperature superposition because time is here, temperature is here, and uh, there is some superposition between time and temperature that allows us to make a shortcut and make uh, the experiments with relatively cheap equipment and get the full master curve of the material without, uh, without waiting long. So if you end up in an asphalt lab and you notice that they are testing at minus 20 or minus 30 or plus 40, it's not about mimicking the environmental conditions. It's about getting enough information to perform a reliable time temperature superposition and provide the full curve for, uh, for the material being tested.